Today, I honor God's Word. The Bible. Remembering the creation. The fall of humankind. The flood. And the Tower of Babel. I remember the patriarch Abraham. And the birth of a nation. I remember the Exodus. The entrance into Canaan. The judges. And the kings beginning with Saul. David and Solomon. I remember the divided kingdom. The Babylonian captivity. And the return of a nation called Israel. I celebrate the coming of the Christ in the Gospels. The life of God's Son. His birth, his three years of ministry, his death, and his resurrection. I recognize the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And the birth of the church in Acts. The letters of Paul and the general epistles. I look forward to the return of Jesus in Revelation. And even now, recognize him as the Alpha and the Omega. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Today. 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 I honor God's word. I honor God's word. I honor God's word. Today, I honor God's word. All right, ACC Victor Bell. How you guys doing? Man, good to see you today. I love that video. It is such a great job. And in case some of those faces are unfamiliar, that's our team. That's not every member, but that's our HDC staff. And as we begin to get more and more multi-site, it's hard to know all the players and people involved, but you saw some great faces of people who really um, just do a great job leading High Desert Church. So I'm grateful. Let's give it up for the comm team who put that video together. That turned out so good. So, well, my name's Todd Arnett. I'm the lead here at the Victorville campus. It's a privilege to get to be here with you today. We're in a series we just began last week called 40 Days in the Word, and we're just gonna push in now in the next message into that. Glad you're here with us in Victorville. Glad you're here with us at Apple Valley and Hesperia. You guys are live streaming this message, and so we're stoked for that and what that means for your service. Folks at Phelan, we're so excited you're here as well. So excited just to be a part of what God is doing at High Desert Church and as we're moving forward in a series that I really think is gonna do some great things for us as far as truly valuing this great gift God has given us in his word. Well, so a couple things. One, if you didn't get notes, you need those today. Those will help you raise your hand in all of our auditoriums. People will make sure we get those to you, help you kind of stay with us and connect the dots. And then secondly, if you have a Bible, book Bible, electronic Bible, whatever you have, if you'd open that to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Now that name in of itself is like a trip, but that's the fifth book in the Bible. So go all the way back to the front, go in five, and it's there in the former or the Old Testament, and you'll find that. And if you turn in Deuteronomy chapter 29, we'll be there shortly, and you'll be able to track with us. Uh, all right, well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna jump right to it. Question that we're answering today, is the Bible powerful? Does the Bible have the power to change your life? And the answer is no. It doesn't have the power to change your life as long as it sits on your shelf or it's an app on your phone that you don't bother to open. The Bible doesn't have the power to change your life if you can paraphrase a few concepts that you think may or may not come from the Bible, like God helps those who help themselves. That's in the good book, right? Not gonna change your life. The Bible's not gonna be powerful in your life if you even come to a place like this, any of our auditoriums, where God's word is being taught, but you're not paying attention. And the Bible isn't gonna change your life. It's not gonna be powerful in your life if you come in and you talk to a pastor like me and we're sitting across the table and we're talking about your circumstances and I open God's word, I'm not giving you my opinion, I open God's word and we look at it and says, this is what God says about what you're going through and yet you ignore it and keep doing your own thing. Then the, power, the, the Bible does not have the power to change your life. However, however, if you will come with even an openness even this sense of just kind of maybe if God's word actually is legitimate and has something to say, even that small amount of faith, and you ask God to help it make sense to you. You ask God to help give clarity so you know what it means, and then you ask God to give you the strength to actually live accordingly, then I have a completely different answer for you. And that is yes, Yes, yes. Because the Bible gives us the power of perspective. 
It gives us truth that we would have not otherwise have known, and then we can know how to live it out, how to live accordingly. And here's the great news, that there are people right now in auditoriums all over this valley that call themselves High Desert Church, and there are literally hundreds of people that would say, when I read the Bible and just simply brought a shred of faith to that reading, God has absolutely transformed my life. And that's what we're excited to look at today. That's the truth that we're excited to get down and unpack. How can the Bible be then that powerful for you too? Here's what happened. You and every other human being who's ever lived, you entered into this life with a bag. A bag of puzzled pieces. A bag that was all broken up and having no idea of what to even do with it. And at times, initially, you just kind of held the bag and just like, I have no idea what this is even about. But then you became curious. You became actually interested in wanting to know what's going on. So you took the bag one day and you spread it out on a table. And all the pieces began to come out and you began to look at them. And as you began to, you began to realize they look like there's an intention, that they're supposed to to do something, to come together. And there were days when even just out of pure curiosity, you would fiddle with a few that might look in the same kind of, you know, maybe they have something in common and try to put them together and then just kind of give up. And there were other times that you got super scientific about it and it was a quest. You were going to put this thing together. But even after a lot of extraordinary effort, you gave up. And others of us, we just kind of look at all the pieces on the table and throw up our hands and go, there's no way to do that. There's nothing to put together at all. We all have this in common, a bag of puzzle pieces. The difference is what do we do once we realize we don't know how they fit together. This is what someone said about our situation, our condition. They said it this way, God did not give us the puzzle box with the picture on the cover. All we have are the pieces and part of the purpose of our existence is to figure out how they fit together. Do you know that this worldview, this understanding of of knowledge, truth, insight, this is held by so many people in your relational world, so many people in your oikos. We can't know. All we have is a bunch of chaos on a table, and that's as good as it's going to get. But I want to offer you a different theory today. I want to offer you the theory that God absolutely gave us the picture that goes to the puzzle. He's given us the box top so now we actually can know how the pieces fit together. In your notes, we call that the Bible. Amen? The Bible is the puzzle box top, is the picture on the front. And God gave us this with with intentionality so that we would know how the pieces are to go together and then we could begin assembling a life according to it. And that's what we're gonna unpack today, that incredible reality of the power, the power of perspective. Now, all of a sudden, when we have the puzzle box top, we can look at this and we can arrange these pieces in a way that actually would be meaningful and would make sense. Last weekend, if you were here with us, Pastor Tom did such a great job kicking off this series. And he was really focusing on this idea of the authority of God's word. And God has the authority to tell us how to live primarily because he created us. We are his creaturely beings and that gives him the right to be in charge. Well, today as we continue into the second idea in this series, we are gonna again remind ourselves that God's authority does give him the right to rule. But what we have in the Bible is far more than just commands to be obeyed. Even though the Bible does contain that, The Bible gives us design. The Bible gives us understanding and perspective of actually not just life, but the best life. The life that you were created to live. That's the beauty. And the problem is this. Every person in this auditorium, every other person in every other one of our auditoriums has all shared the same dilemma. The dilemma is that at least at seasons of your life or maybe long periods of your life, the Bible looked restrictive. It looked oppressive in keeping you from things you thought you wanted to do. But then we begin to read it. We begin to realize the truth that it embodies and we begin to understand the Bible gives freedom. 
The Bible gives life. The Bible is a book that blesses us because we finally know what it's all about, what life is all about. This coming week in your small group video curriculum, I wanna know, by the way, how many in this auditorium and all our auditoriums, raise your hand, how many are in a small group right now going through 40 days in the Word? Raise your hand up high. Very cool. Some are our traditional groups, some are just the 40 days groups. This week, you're gonna have a video and Pastor Brian's gonna do a great job of just talking about the difference between general and particular revelation. Well, under the idea of particular revelation, when God is making himself expressly known Moses was writing to the group of Israelites who were gonna finally cross over the Jordan into the promised land. This new generation was going to finally engage the promises made to their parents. And in doing so, what Moses does is he gets the people out and he says, God has made a covenant and you have the option today to enter into it or not. If you enter into it and if you keep it, this is how God will bless your life. However, if you enter into it and choose to turn to the right or to the left, this is how God will deal with you. And he actually uses the word curses. These are the curses that will fall on your head if you choose to walk away from a covenant you make. So think wisely, do you wanna make the covenant? The people resoundingly agree, yes, we want a covenant with God. And at the end of that sequence, your Bibles are open to Deuteronomy 29. This is what Moses writes, these incredibly insightful words. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things revealed, those things, they belong to us and to our children forever. Why? So that we may follow all the words of this law. We don't know everything about God's character and God's ways. He's not revealed it all to us. But what he has revealed, those are for us so that what? So that we may follow all the words that he has said, all the ways that we are to live. That's what I wanna wrap our minds around today. That revelation is for us, that we might be blessed by it, and that we might walk according to it. The three things we're gonna focus on today, what has God revealed to us that helps us understand him upwardly? What do we know about ourselves inwardly from the Bible? And what do we know outwardly to live forward in other people's lives? So let's dig in, let's look at the puzzle box top today, gaze upon it, and see what God wants us to know. Number one in your notes, God has given us information about what is upward. The Bible tells me in part who God is. The Bible tells me in part who God is. Now we said that all of us, likewise, we showed up on this planet with this bag, a bag full of puzzle pieces. We all had that in common. But I want you to know that there were things that you as a human being, you understood about the character and the ways or, or, the, or just the, the nature and the existence of God before you ever had a Bible. Before you ever opened up scripture, you knew some things about the world you lived in. Like we said, our video curriculum this week is gonna give some definition to both general and particular revelation. Let me get ahead of that. General revelation is this, that which God has made known to everyone, no matter who you are, where you live, or when you live. General revelation is that which God has made known to everyone, no matter who you are, where you live, or when you live. All human beings have this. This is the puzzle pieces in the bag, and here's what a few of them are. Number one, we all know that there is a powerful being out there. We don't necessarily know his name. We don't even know if he's a he, but we just know there's something big out there, powerful and divine, different from us. We also know that that being, we want to have a relationship with it. Philosophers call it a God-shaped void or a God-shaped vacuum that you want to connect with the divine. Thirdly, we actually are all built with a conscience. We have a moral compass that even in our own spirit, things we do, we say, we think, we know are categorically right or wrong. And fourthly, we know that that being out there provides for us, does something for us that we can't do by ourselves, keeps our world from spinning out of control, provides rain like we've experienced this weekend, provides food for us that we can't manufacture apart from it. 
We often chalk it up to Mother Nature, but today as we look at the Bible, I want you to see that it's really from Father God. These are the things that you knew that I knew before I ever cracked open a Bible. Simple question, what if God, what if God wanted you to know more than just the fact that he may exist? What if he wanted to know things about who he was and how he acted? What if he wanted to develop a relationship with you and fill the God-shaped vacuum you have in your life? Well, the what if answer is that he did, and he did it through this thing called the Bible. Look at some on the screen. These are some of the broad strokes that the Bible teaches us about the character of God, a God who loves us immensely and wants us to know him. From cover to cover, these are five concepts we see. We see that God is a triune creator. We see this idea of this three-in-one personality literally from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And as you simply read scripture, you come away with this idea that God is somehow in community with himself and that he has spoken the universe into existence. Number two, you read about this God who is a ruler, this God who is definitely, consistently in control of what is happening in his created universe. He has not just put it all together, spun it into motion and let it go and is on a vacation in the Bahamas. He's connected and involved. The Bible calls it being sovereign over all that is. The Bible teaches us in a broad stroke that God is presented as a judge. One who rightly sits in a courtroom who himself embodies truth, who himself embodies that which is right, who himself embodies that which is holy. And he brings all of creation into this courtroom to stand against that standard. We see this cover to cover in the Bible. For some of us, we get to that part of God's character and we get a little twingy all of a sudden. Because first off, we live in a culture today where judgment is a dirty word. But I will tell you, whether you understand it today or whether you understand it in the future, you will be grateful that God is a righteous judge who is going to bring all things, all of us, all of creation to account at his level of righteousness because any God who is less than that is a God that you can't have confidence in. The great news is that God is not only a judge, but the Bible presents him as savior. The God who sits on the throne, as it were, of this courtroom, he gets off the chair and he comes and stands in your place. He stands in your place being condemned that you don't meet that standard. He stands there and says, but I do. And I will pay whatever price is necessary for you to be counted as right if you would just respond if you would just let me take your place. God, cover to cover, demonstrates himself to be a savior. And finally, number five, God shows himself to be a redeemer. Not only is he bringing people in right relationship with them and rescuing them, but he redeems, he makes all things new. And the Bible says he's in the process of doing it now and he's gonna bring it to completion. This is the God you would have never known had you never had a Bible because these truths are contained there. And by the way, this God that I've just given you huge, just big broad strokes, we could talk for hours about his character and his ways. This God is bigger and better than any myth we've ever come up with on our own. Because he's that good. Now the reality is, what do you do with this information? What do you do with a God who presents himself this way? Here's the wild thing. The most complete revelation of God is not even the Bible. It's Jesus. The Bible teaches us that Jesus, fully God, fully man, entered into our world, was God the Word, John chapter one, the Word put on flesh and took up residence in our neighborhood. Jesus is the full expression and revelation of God and we have things about his life recorded, thank God, in our Bible. 
Look at this great summary from Colossians chapter one, talking about this Jesus, this full representation and revelation of God. He writes this, Paul's the author here. The son, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased, watch this, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. The revelation of God and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Whereas before you were here, tinkering with pieces, trying to figure some things out, God offers up the picture, puts it in front of you, and you begin to do what every great puzzle artist does. I gotta tell you, when I was a kid, I hated making puzzles. Even those kid ones, right, that only have 10 pieces, I hated them because they just required so much patience, and I was an impatient kid. Apparently, when you get old, you both grow in patience and you become a dud. Because I actually like making puzzles now. It actually seems fun, like a challenge. Like, I'm living on the edge, I'm building a 500 piecer today, you know? <laughs> but it's funny, when we'll have uh, times when my wife's family comes over, one of our typical habits is to set up a table and, and take a puzzle like this, dump it on the table, and like any good puzzle makers will do, what do we do first? Take out all the straight edges. Take out all the straight edges because we want to build the frame. In your notes, when we understand better who God is, it frames the puzzle of life. Knowing who God is sets up the frame and begins to give definition to what life is and what we're supposed to do with these puzzle pieces. That brings us to number two. Secondly, God's word teaches us about who we are inward. The Bible tells me in part who I am about who I am inward, giving you understanding, giving me understanding. Here's the, the quest. The quest that we seem to all be about is self-awareness. Who am I? Why am I here? Those, those are a common human craving to understand. We were really privileged about a month ago to have Andrew and Isabel McCourt be our guest speakers up at uh, Forest Home for our Married Couples Weekend. And one thing Andrew said was so great. He said, he gave a quote. He said, the two best days in your life is the day that you're born and the day that you understand why. And that sums it up, doesn't it? I don't wanna just be here, I wanna know why I'm here. What am I supposed to be doing? And the reality is this, before you ever opened up a Bible, before you ever had scripture in front of you, you knew some things about your human condition. What'd you know? You knew that you needed community. There are very few people in this auditorium today or any of our others who were raised by a pack of wolves. We live in the high desert, so there's a few, okay? <laughs> Most of you not, okay? And so in that community of human beings that you were ushered into, you realize from the earliest time, I need people. I was built for community. You knew that before you had a Bible. You also knew that you were dependent, dependent upon other people and resources to keep actually staying alive. It was true when you were a baby, it was true when you were a toddler, it was true when you were a teenager, and it's true today. You are not an independent being, you need things. Thirdly, you had dreams, you had goals. As you got older, things that you wanted to achieve and accomplish, and you thought, I, I want to do these things, and maybe they'll bring a sense of, of great satisfaction. Along the way, you realized just really soon that you wanted to be loved. You wanted someone to value you, to validate you, and just to make you feel like you mattered. 
And finally, before you ever had a Bible, you had that conscience. You had that reality of knowing that, that the things, that these just vague moral realities, you knew there were right and wrong things, and you knew that the things you wanted to stay away from, you kept doing those things. And the things you wanted to engage, you failed to do those things. And, and you're like, what is going on? You knew that there was a compass within you that was there that not only pointed to truth and, and right and wrong, but actually demonstrated that you couldn't even keep your own grid, your own line, your own marker of how you ought to live. These are all things that you knew before you ever cracked open a Bible. And then what happened is you got a little time. You got a few steps on this trail. You started to put a few puzzle pieces together and you realized some things. You realized that the community that you were built for was challenging because all people are different and not like you and there's some communities you wanted to be a part of and couldn't get into. There are other communities that wanted you and you didn't want anything to do with. Community became challenging. You realize within the mix uh, of, of being hardwired with these desires to, to have dreams, to have goals to shoot at. You began to realize that within them that you would actually achieve them. You made the team, you got the job. You, you engaged that friendship you were hoping to have. But every time you would succeed, you realized that it was hollow. You realize it was like grasping the wind for just literally moments you would feel satisfaction only to be empty again. And all that did was set into motion that there are more things you must have to go accomplish and achieve because someday you'll feel satisfied. You realize that in your dependence, the fact that you needed other people and you needed things to even stay alive, there were people that you counted on who failed you. They didn't come through with basic needs that you were expecting and hoping they would and that resulted in loss and hurt. The idea of wanting to be loved, wanting someone to value and validate you, you realized it was really challenging because as you began to draw close to people, you recognized their neediness and you kind of began to recognize it in yourself. And what you realized was two needy people have a very, very difficult time meeting each other's needs because they're so consumed meeting their own. And all of a sudden, this whole idea of being loved seemed a lot less interesting than you originally thought. And that idea of your moral compass, your conscience, and, and continually struggling to even keep your own sense of right and wrong, what did that do? It began to pile up guilt and shame on your back. You never needed a God to tell you you were a sinner. You already knew you couldn't even keep your own moral code. And at the end of this reality, you realize that life was a lot more tarnished over time. That it didn't have to offer what it initially seemed so ideal and so basic. Those things were so challenging. And you realize at best, life is a rough road and maybe there'll be sprinklings of happiness every few months for some, even every few years. And otherwise, you're just gonna keep putting one foot in front of the next. Are, are you depressed yet? Because I know, I know you're going, Todd, I don't like even being a person after hearing all this. <laughs> but can I, can I tell you about that day? Can I tell you about those series of events that when you began to open a Bible, when it began to become, become known to you, not only did you hear these amazing things about a creator God who desperately loves you, but you began to open the Bible and the Bible actually became a mirror to your own soul. You began to read in these pages who you are and what you were created to be. And all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, life, life took a different angle. Where originally you had this moral code that you couldn't keep, a lot of guilt and shame on your shoulders, you actually found out that your moral code was way down here and the almighty, holy God, his was through the roof. You actually came face to face with God's holiness and realized, I don't even begin to compare to what God expects. What am I to do? And the great news is, as soon as those words came out of your mouth, you realized that God 
God said, I know you can't, and I know you so deeply have been looking for love all of your life. I'm who you've been looking for. Because I love you without a neediness. I don't need you to do something in return for what I willingly give to you. I give you value, I give you validation, and I give you purpose. And the idea of being loved was something that you had never known before. The dreams and the goals that you had, once you'd achieved, they'd fallen short, they were hollow. Now you realize that those dreams were so small. Those goals tended to be very self-centered and now you had a new grid, a new way to think, a new purpose in life and your new set of goals and dreams were huge because they were about perpetuating and moving forward the kingdom of God and being about God's rescue efforts on the planet and now, now you lived for an audience of one and pleasing him was the goal and when you achieved those milestones along the way, they were incredibly satisfying and incredibly joyous because now you knew what you were living for. That idea, that idea of dependence, being dependent on others and having them fail you, you realize as you began to look around, there are a lot of other people in the same boat. People who were broken, often at the hands of others. And you realize, rather than just sit there and sulk in your own pain, as real as your pain was, you realize that actually the need that other people had, you actually had something now worth offering. Because of what God had done for you, you had something worth sharing with them. And in their brokenness, you could actually be a source of empathy that they'd never met before. Because you knew what it was like for God to heal you. And that sense of community, wanting to have true connection to other people, it actually kind of caught you by surprise. You, you found it in the least likely place. You found it with a group of people who didn't have in common with you your ethnicity. They didn't have in common with you your economics. They didn't have in common with you your interests, but what they had in common was the fact that you all rallied around the same Savior who saved each and every one of you. His name is Jesus, and you are rightfully right when you call them brother and sister because that is who they are. It changed everything. The Bible actually became a mirror that now began to teach you, began to show you who God had intended you always to be. Paul, in a succinct way, writing to his protege Titus, he writes this. Look at these words. For the grace of God appeared that offers salvation to whom? To all people. Grace, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. What? While we wait for the blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem, to buy back from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that, is, that are his very own, look at the last phrase, eager to do what is good. The Bible brought you so much understanding about who you are in your notes. When you understand who you are, it gives definition and substance to the puzzle of life. It begins to actually take shape. Something is beginning to appear. And for that, you're infinitely grateful. Well, it leads us to our, our third point. If the Bible tells us things about who he is upward and who we are inward, then it also tells us about who others are outward. The Bible helps us understand what life is about outside of us in an outward way because it tells me in part who others are. I wanna tell you there are a lot of Christians who are super excited about the first point. I'm so excited that the Bible teaches me vertically upward who God is. I just, there's, there's so much of God to get to know and appreciate and love. And then they look at the Bible as a, as a mirror into their own soul and go, God, I'm so grateful for what you teach me inwardly so I can know who I am and what I was created to be. But then they kind of finish there. And they're like, God, I'm just super happy that it's you and me. And can you make all these weird people go away? 
That, I just know so many Christians like that that are just all about them and God and they just could care less about anybody else. And I wanna tell you, those people don't go to High Desert Church. Because every single weekend, we push on the fact that God has you here for the purpose of investing in other people's lives. So I'm gonna tell you something that just simply continues to beat on the same foundation, but it's so true and it's so real. You knew some things about other people before you ever opened up a Bible. You knew that they were similar to you and that they're all part of the human race. There's some things that are undeniable. But then you saw differences. And some of those differences were admirable because you're like, that person's super skilled at this, or that person's got this great part about their personality. But more often than not, the differences in other people just kind of drove you nuts. They were the kind of things that you would just want to be annoyed and irritated by. You would say this about those types of people. Some people are like clouds. Once they leave, it's a beautiful day. <laughs> right? And you're just like, God, I just want to see the blue sky and the sunshine. Take Bob away, you know? And, and so that reality, that's kind of how life was working with other people. But God did this. God revealed something to you. As you began to read the Bible, you began to understand better who other people were. And you understood something. You understood that as a follower of Jesus, that you were to be exactly that, a follower of Jesus. What did Jesus do? He was the word in flesh. So if I'm to follow his example, I am to be about the truth of God's word in flesh, incarnate in my world. And I also realized that what God did is he initiated the relationship between him and I, so therefore I'm gonna initiate relationships with other people. I'm not gonna wait for people to come to me. I'm going to enter into their world and go to them. You realize some other things. You realize that even the cloudy ones, they were ones that God had built in his own image. And, and, and what you began to do is, rather than just simply judge people from an initial impression or, or something that was annoying about their personality, you actually began to look deeper. You began to look under the surface because God's word says that every human being is built and, and formed in, in the fashion and the image of God. You, you had to dig deep for some but you kept looking and you kept finding that shred of the divine in them that you could value and you could say, God, thank you for this person. Now there were some in your life that were far more than just annoying. They'd hurt you deeply. They'd hurt you so deeply that it often would spin you into a, a tailspin of, of bitterness and just revenge. But you open God's word and you begin to read about the fact that, that God said that it was reasonable. It, it was something within you, within a transformed life, you actually had the potential and the ability to forgive completely makes no sense, it's absolute opposite of what is fair. You could forgive other people who've wounded you deeply because of how God forgave you. And you realized that about others and you were liberated to now forgive rather than deceive. You were freed to forgive rather than to be held in bondage and bitterness. And for that you said, thank you God for helping me understand who others are. All of this came from the Bible, and really at the end of the day when you boil it down, what you learn from the Bible is God's really about two things, love him and love others. Jesus said it succinctly, Matthew chapter 22. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now by the way, I want you to see this. What's the greatest commandment in the law? In Jesus' time, he only had the first 39 books of your Bible, but that's what the guy's asking him. In all the Bible, what matters most? From the revelation of God, what should we focus on the most? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. 
Interestingly enough, he keeps talking. He only asked for one, and the second is like it. Don't get consumed again with this vertical thing and wish people would just leave you alone. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law. All of this revelation, the law and the prophets, they hang on these two commandments. When you looked in the Bible and you began to understand the nature and the reality of how God had built other people, in your notes, what that actually did is it completed the puzzle. Knowing who others are completes the puzzle of life. I picked this puzzle, by the way, on purpose. We built it a couple Christmases ago, and it's a, a puzzle of Maui. And I gotta say, the great news is, once you get this all figured out, you get to go there. So, <laughs> super, super good. I wanna wrap up our time by just sharing with you some insight into an experience I had that helped me value the word of God like I never had before. I've told you before, I grew up in a Christian home. I don't remember not going to church, grew up in a Christian school, went to Christian college, on the list goes. Been around the Bible literally all my life. But I gotta tell you, there was a moment in my life that I understood the value of scripture that I had previously never really embraced like I had then. The experience goes back to this guy. This guy's name is Ming Kai. I love Ming Kai's smile. It's just so rich and it just covers his whole face, doesn't it? But life always wasn't like that for Ming Kai. I had the chance a lifetime ago, it feels like, as a youth pastor to literally meet him. And in meeting him, I remember him telling, through a translator, telling us the story of how he, he didn't really meet his wife, he kidnapped her. Minkai was looking for a wife and with some friends from his tribe, the Wadani tribe, he went upstream. And he found a woman that he wanted, a young girl actually, and what he did, he literally grabbed her by the hair and pulled her out of her hut. But as they were doing that, so he wouldn't have to worry about the back end of, of family coming back for her, him and his friends speared to death all of her family. So there'd be no concern about them coming for her. That's the world Minkai lived in. And so it wouldn't be actually that big of a stretch, a life full of chaoticness, full of savagery, full of simply surviving by killing others. That was Ming Kai's life. So it wouldn't be that far-fetched that when a group of American missionaries, as they had begun making entrances into the Warani tribe, and one day, 60 years ago, this last January, one day when they took a tiny little plane and landed on a tiny little beach, it would make sense that when they came with the express purpose of bringing the truth of God's word to Minkai and the Wadani tribe, it wouldn't be too far-fetched that when they began to interact with Minkai and the others, that Minkai and the others did exactly what they'd done in any other experience and they speared these five missionaries to death. 1956, January the 8th. Just kind of look at Minkai and you go, I'm pretty sure that someone who lives a savage life doesn't have a smile like that. So what happened? A wild thing happened, and that is one of those five missionaries' wives and one of their sisters actually went back. They were all air flighted out for safety reasons, but after a few months, these two women went back into the Wadani tribe. Not only does that blow our minds, it blew their minds. And what these two women, Elizabeth and Rachel, began to do is the Wadani's had a spoken language but not a written one, so they actually began to just simply love and meet these people and began to hear their language and began to document it in written form. Then they took the word of God with the Wadani language and they actually trans, they, um, translated the Bible into Wadani. 
And so now Minkai and the other people in this tribe, they actually had the word of God for the very first time. The exact reason her husband and her brother went to the Waranis now was being fulfilled. And while not every member of the Warani tribe put their faith in Christ, Minkai did. In your notes and on this screen, this was his reaction. He would later say these things. We acted badly. Badly until what? They brought us God's carvings. Now we walk his trail. Now we walk his trail. You say, Todd, that's a powerful story from the jungles of the Amazon, but I've never speared to death my (laughs) in-laws, yet. I've never speared five American missionaries. I've never lived a life of savagery, but I wanna ask you, but did you live a life of chaos? Did you live a life of confusion? Did you live a life with a bunch of puzzle pieces but no picture. Because if you did, I don't think you're that different than Minkai. Just expressing it in a different way. The wild thing is, I got to meet Minkai 20 years ago. My youth group in Lancaster had this incredible privilege of being in the Amazon jungle with him and others for four days. And I'll never forget sitting around a fire one night and, and me and our, my wife and our students on one side and fire and then on the other side, Minkai actually dressed in his kind of tribal garb. And as Minkai was sitting across from us with the, from the fire, there was another gentleman there. An, another gentleman, this gentleman, Steve. And Steve, just like in the picture, Steve had his hand on Minkai's shoulder. And Minkai doesn't speak a lot of English, but Steve as he was talking that night, he was sharing with us, this is literally our first or second night there, he's sharing with us some of the backstory, and as his hand is on Minkai's shoulder, he says, this man, this man killed my father. Now he didn't say it choked up like I am, he said it as straight as the day is long, this man killed my father. Because Steve Saint was Nate Saint's son. And it was his Aunt Rachel who went back into the jungle to share the gospel with the Rani. And when Rachel had died, Steve came back with his family to help the church continue to thrive. You may not have known the brokenness and the hollowness of losing your dad at four. But what causes a man to go through that kind of lifelong trauma, but come back to the very people, to the very man who was responsible for his father's death. You see, what I'm gonna tell you today is that just like Minkai said, we acted badly, badly until they brought us God's carvings. I think Steve would say the same thing. I acted badly, badly until they brought us God's carvings and now. Now I walk his trail. See, what I don't want you to do today is leave here holding a bag of puzzle pieces, still thinking that there's no picture, there's no way to know how to put them together when God has so amazingly and graciously provided you the box top. He's given you the power of perspective. Engage it. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you today so grateful for your gracious gift of the Bible. So grateful for your gracious gift of perspective so we would have the picture. As we came into this life holding the bag, now we have the picture to build according to. And we say thank you because we know we are blessed We know that it is only because of that kind of grace of your revelation that we have hope, that we have a map to know the trail to walk. You may be here today 
and whether you know a lot about the Bible or a little, what you still have not yet done with the Bible is your next step. Your next step in, in, in having these carvings, as it were, is to actually respond to the God who has written them to you, written them to you. And he says that I want to have a relationship with you. I want to rescue you from your sin. And I've already provided a way. All I need for you to do is respond, to engage, to accept that gift. At HGC, we call it the ABCs. A is to admit. Admit that you're a sinner. We said that even before you had the Bible, you knew that you did wrong. Now, the Bible just gives it shape, gives it a name. It's called sin. And God can't tolerate it. God will judge it. But praise God, be as believe. God judged it in the person of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross in your place. Believe that Jesus is the only savior available who came expressly for the purpose to seek and save that which was lost, to seek and save you. And so C is choose. Once you believe that idea, you choose Jesus. I absolutely believe you came for that purpose. I want to live now. Now that I know who I am, I know why I'm here, I wanna live in your footsteps, following your trail. You can make that choice right here, right now, before you ever leave. And that would be my plea to you today. Don't leave here holding a bag of pieces when you can build according to the picture. Father, we love you. Thank you for your immense grace on us. And we pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.